Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I don't have anything off the top, Matt, so if you want to uh, yeah, kick us off. Nothing off the top at all. Nothing huh? off the top. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's just uh, start with um, the situation in the Middle East and uh, what's your uh, understanding of where things stand at the moment. Well, Matt, we continue to uh, work closely with partners in Egypt and Qatar. Uh, our understanding is that they are still pressing their uh, Hamas interlocutors to see uh, that any uh, gaps that uh, exist as it relates to uh, the ceasefire deal that we've been talking about for so long, uh, that there might be ways to uh, close that gap. Uh, and we're still hopeful and we're watching that space very closely. Uh, the president and the secretary were um, clear when they laid this out. We believe that this threes phase ceasefire proposal that Israel has made to Hamas and that the UN Security Council has endorsed is the best way to end the violence in Gaza and ultimately end the conflict. And we're continuing to push to try and close this deal. Right. But you've seen the latest from Hamas that they don't, uh, that it's not good enough, right? Matt, I'm not going to get into the you have ins, you, and, ins and outs. I'm not asking you to get into it. Have you seen it? I'm not aware of a, a recent proposal or a communication from Hamas, aside from the uh, one uh, a number of weeks ago. Um, but again, I'm not going to uh, negotiate uh, or uh, get into the back and forth on this publicly. What I will just say, and uh, again, is that our viewpoint is that the time for haggling is over and it's time for a ceasefire. Uh, we and our partners agree that the deal um, uh, it has to be grounded in the principles of the ceasefire proposal that the entire international community um, already supports. And Hamas has previously agreed to similar uh, iterations of this proposal. So they need to sign on to the version that uh, was shared in front of them. Okay. And then uh, last one, I just done the, the, the north, or Israel's north, Lebanon's south. Yeah. Uh, what's the current, what's your current concern about the possibility of a broader conflict there. So I don't have a prognosis to offer, Matt, but restoring the calm mm. along the blue line, it continues to remain a top priority for us, and it uh, must be of utmost importance to Lebanon and Israel as well. Uh, we continue to be concerned by the level of violence, and we're continuing to work towards a diplomatic solution that would allow Israeli and Lebanese uh, citizens to return their homes and live in peace and security. Uh, when the president laid out that ceasefire that we were just talking about, Matt, he said in his remarks uh, that uh, a ceasefire and a hostage deal in Gaza uh, will accelerate the possibility of progress, including lasting security uh, among Israel's northern border with Lebanon. And so that's something we're going to continue to work towards. Thank you. Leon. Yeah, just to follow up on Gaza, uh, what do you make of the uh, evacuation orders, again, that were released today uh, in Khan Yunis and, and Rafa? Um, you've always said that you were against all displacement of populations and uh, poor Palestinians have been going up, down, east, west. Uh, and now again, they had just fled. And now they came back. And now they have to leave again. What do you make of those orders today? So, uh, of course, Leon, uh, when it comes to one of our key uh, tenants of this conflict, the secretary uh, was very clear in Tokyo that there can be no uh, permanent displacement of uh, of Gazans. Uh, of course, over the course of this military operation uh, that the IDF is conducting, and I will let them speak to uh, specific logistical parameters, um, as those operations are being conducted, uh, it is, of course, pertinent that uh, civilians and um, uh, non-militants uh, be asked to appropriately uh, evacuate for safety concerns. Uh, but again, these are all uh, logistical parameters that the IDF can speak to. When it comes to the tenant of uh, how we've been talking about Rafa, there has been no change in our policy. We continue to believe that any uh, major military incursion into Rafa we would be uh, opposed to, but yet we have uh, yet to see any kind of uh, incursion uh, to take place thus far. Camilla. Thank you. Just back to um, Lebanon, we've yeah. seen a couple of alerts go out from U.S. Embassy Beirut over the last uh, few days, um, and the most recent today was a uh, uh, one about flight restrictions. Can you just give us um, a little bit more detail at all on, on um, or any kind of insight into 
possible preparations for for Americans um, as things continue to be very tense on the border there. Um, I know that you can't get into too much detail, but uh, what can we expect in, in terms of like um, the kind of uh, options that state has to help Americans if need be and needs to pivot there last minute? So let me say a couple things. First, uh, for those who may not be tracking, the uh, country of Lebanon as a whole currently is a uh, at the travel advisory warning level of level three, uh, reconsider travel. Uh, but the specific region of southern Lebanon uh, is at a level four. It's at a level four do not travel level, level as is level Lebanon's border with Syria, as well as uh, refugee settlements uh, throughout Lebanon. Uh, we undertake this kind of work and planning um, at all of our uh, uh, first, to, let me say that when it comes to our travel advisory warnings, we make those assessments and changes based on circumstances on the ground, and we'll continue to assess what situations are like should there need to be any kind of change in travel advisory warning. Uh, when it comes to supporting American citizens, we have no higher priority than the safety and security of U.S. citizens overseas. Uh, and in many countries, the security environment remains complex and can change quickly. Uh, any citizen traveling abroad anywhere, our message to them has always been that they should enroll in Smart Traveler uh, to be best informed about uh, any communication from the U.S. government. Uh, we also encourage that in uh, Lebanon that uh, U.S. citizens have their own departure pl plans in place, and uh, we don't have any announcement to make on any evacuation of private citizens from Lebanon. But what I can say is that the U.S. government remains diligent in planning and preparing for any and all possible emergency contingencies. And this is work that happens not just in Lebanon, but at all of our diplomatic facilities, at our embassies and consulates uh, around the world. This is what we do, and it's part of our contingency planning. Uh, but I wouldn't speak to any more specifics beyond that. And, and just given that these alerts have gone out in the last few days or within a week, do we read that as uh, as there, being, there has been an escalation in the past few days, or is this just a culmination of... This is the State Department and the U.S. government wanting to offer American citizens in the country and in the region and those who may have loved ones in the country and the region to have the most uh, informed um, information as possible and uh, have the best avenues to stay in touch with the U.S. government. Nick. Different region, but somewhat related. Can I see if anybody else has anything else, then I will come back to you. Simon, did you have... No, no one this region. Okay. Kylie, go ahead. It was reported over the weekend that the U.S. proposed new language to bridge the gaps. You were saying you've been working to bridge the gaps between Hamas and Israel for a hostage release and ceasefire. Um, can you share with us if that uh, new proposal was signed off on by Israel before the U.S. put it forth, or did you guys share it with both sides, like just where that stands at this moment? So I'm not going to get into the specifics of uh, where we are in our conversations uh, with uh, Israel and other regional partners. I will leave it at what I said to Matt, that uh, uh, our partners in Qatar and Egypt continue to press uh, Hamas interlocutors on ways uh, to close this gap. Uh, the president, the secretary uh, have all been engaged on this uh, directly, and we continue to feel strongly that the ceasefire proposal that the president laid out a number of weeks ago uh, continues to be the best way to get a surge in humanitarian assistance, release all the remaining hostages, and uh, perhaps most importantly, get us on a path to greater and broader uh, diplomatic conversations that has the potential to get this region out of these uh, count countless um, cycles of violence that we've uh, been experiencing. So no time frame for expectations as to when the... No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't speak to back. time frames with the specifics of the deliberations from up here. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Virant. Uh, Secretary Blinken today at Brookings stressed again the need for uh, a plan for the day after, and without it, it will be chaos or may. And he's also said that there's three things that the U.S. will not uh, accept: uh, Israeli occupation, Hamas getting back to power, or chaos. But what we hear from the Israeli government all the time, that they are not ready yet to discuss such plans, and uh, they're not do they don't want this Gaza Strip to be ruled by Hamas or even the PLO. And we know that you've been stated many times, you are mad that you are stressing the Israelis and keep talking with them about this. Did you reach anywhere with them? Are they going to 
talk to you about their future plans for the day after. So we have stressed the importance of there being um, some plans for uh, the day after. This is nothing new. This is something that the secretary has been engaged on for a number of months now, and it's been a key piece of the shuttle diplomacy that he's been engaged on in the region. Uh, it's not for me to speak to the Israelis or uh, to the foreign policy and the policies that they're interested in pursuing. But what I can say from our perspective is that in every conversation that we've had with our partners in Israel and other regional partners, we have stressed um, the principles that the secretary laid out in Tokyo last fall. And part of that, we have stressed that there is a uh, responsibility to have a plan for a day after uh, to ensure that these things can come to fruition, that Hamas uh, can no longer use Gaza as a springboard for terrorism uh, on the Israeli people, that uh, uh, Israel can no longer be uh, uh, an occupying power for Gaza, that uh, there we get us on a path to a diplomatic solution and uh, get us on a path to two states uh, that have equal measures of um, integrity and uh, uh, security for uh, Israelis and Palestinians. And these are conversations we'll continue to have. But are they susceptible to this push? Because publicly, they seems not. It should come as no surprise that over the course of this conflict, we of course had uh, policy disagreements and uh, with our partners in Israel, but we'll continue to engage on these conversations. But uh, we have stressed at every turn that there is a responsibility and a need to make sure that there is a plan uh, for a day after. Uh, Michelle, go ahead. Uh, we don't Arab League assistance. General has said during the weekend that the League's uh, member states uh, concurred that the labeling of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization should no longer be employed. Do you agree with the Arab League on this? So I, I've seen those reports, Michelle, and we're looking into them. But let me just say unequivocally that there is no question that Hezbollah remains a dangerous terrorist organization and uh, a destabilizing force in the Middle East. Uh, we believe that there is no reason to take steps to remove such a designation. And we have continued to urge governments uh, around the world to designate, ban, or restrict Hezbollah. Uh, 16 governments from across the world have heeded this call since 2019, and we'll continue to have those uh, conversations. But again, I just want to reiterate, in our point of view, Hezbollah remains a very dangerous terrorist organization. Um, Thank you. Simon, I say you had your hand up. Yeah, just moving to a slightly separate subject. Sure. Just since this is the, the first uh, briefing you've had since the debate on Thursday, there's obviously been a lot of um, responses uh, over the, the president's performance. I know this isn't the White House, um, but I, I also want to note that the secretary doesn't have any uh, um, events this week where we'll have a chance to ask him directly. So this, this is a, a forum to try and ask. Um, and he was asked about this this morning. Um, not by a journalist, I should say, at, at Brookings Institution, um, about, you know, globally there has been, a res a res as well as domestically, there has been some response to the uh, the president's performance on the debate stage that's raised, you know, raising some questions about about his ability to, uh, to lead, to respond to crises. Uh, you know, from this building's point of view, is there anything you want to say in response to that. I think Secretary Blinken uh, laid out our point of view on this uh, pretty clearly, um, and so I would just echo uh, what he said. Um, and to give just a snippet, the Secretary was uh, pretty clear and succinct that uh, the world and world leaders know uh, the President, they know uh, the policies that he pursues and uh, he champions, um, and they uh, like and believe in the policies that we're pursuing. Next week, we'll, uh, the, the Washington area has the uh, great opportunity to host uh, NATO leaders for the 75th uh, NATO summit, uh, which I think will be another uh, opportunity to talk about this administration's uh, commitment to having a seat at a table and this administration's commitment to showing that American engagement uh, matters. Um, and so we'll continue to have those conversations. But I will leave uh, punditry uh, and uh, electioneering to to others uh, in DC. Uh, have you had any um, contacts from from allies or, or or other countries, you know, expressing concern over over this performance and asking to to sort of 
as for reassurance? Uh, again, I, I have no diplomatic conversations to speak to, but I will just echo again that um, world leaders uh, know this president and they know uh, this is a, a president who has worked at the cross section of foreign policy for decades and they know and believe in the policies that he and this administration uh, are pursuing. Well, leaving aside the punditry and electioneering, what was your reaction? What was the reaction of this building? Uh, that it's really not my, appropriate for me to be uh, offering any commentary on uh, something like a debate from up here, and I think you've been covering the State Department long enough to, yeah, to, to know but that. the question's got to be asked. I appreciate you asking it, I guess, but I'm well, going no, to you, politely. You don't I'm going to no, no, that, Matt. That, I do that, appreciate. That from your I do appreciate no, any no, question you, you ask, and but I will politely. Is a much overused uh, word. I, I, I will politely uh, decline. Uh, uh, okay, to, to, fair to enough. Comment but on so it. to follow up on something, you've heard absolutely nothing. You're not aware of anything that any foreign government has said since Thursday night to you or to anyone you're not aware of. Uh, about what happened. That is correct. Nothing. Correct. Okay. Uh, Just one former question. Go ahead. Had this building, have you guys given any guidance to your top diplomats who are serving um, in a political capacity because they've been picked by this president in terms of how they should be answering questions about if Biden will remain the nominee from their interlocutors overseas? People who are employees of the State Department, whether they are uh, Schedule C, whether they are a, um, uh, a, a presidentially nominated uh, person in that position, uh, are well aware of what uh, their roles and responsibilities are in speaking to uh, domestic politics in any kind of official capacity. Uh, so that's not a yes or a no. That's Go ahead, Sam. Yes. <laughs> You know, tagging onto the debate question, is it some concern in this building that not just a lot of the international community, but even President, former President Trump said that, no, Israel is the one that's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. ensuring that the, uh, that the war, that the attack in Gaza continues? There, is there some concern that there's going to be a broader consensus contrary to the claims of the of the State Department, the administration, that Hamas is the hold up here. Uh, I'm not sure. I I'm not sure. I fully understand your question, Sam. What exactly are you asking? Well, that there was some substance in the debate, and as uh, there tend to be in presidential yeah, debates, and, and, and Trump and uh, Biden depicted Hamas as the lone holdout uh, for preventing a stop to the fighting, and Trump said, "No, actually, Israel is the holdout," and then he quickly added that. Uh, uh, th that it should that it should continue uh, to kill Palestinians. Uh, so although he took a very militaristic p perspective, he actually acknowledged the underlying truth shared by a great deal of the international community that in fact it is Israel that is holding up a so, to the conflict. Uh, is that and, that must be a concern to you? It, it is not. Any person on the on a on any particular debate stage is, of course, entitled to whatever opinion they want. When it comes to the current ongoing conflict in Gaza, we remain uh, incredibly committed of continuing to work with partners in Qatar, partners in Egypt, uh, partners in Israel uh, to see what can be done to close uh, the gap as it relates to the ceasefire uh, proposal that the president laid out a number of weeks ago. We continue to believe that that is uh, the best path forward to get uh, hostile hostages released to get a surge of humanitarian aid into Gaza and as well as uh, to get us onto a path of diplomacy to have greater conversations for peace and stability in the region. Well, I want I to come back Biden to Kylie recently, real quick it, because I, I, was, I did not mean to be so flippant and moving on. I was just trying <laughs> to, to, yeah. to work the room. So again, just to let me reiterate, uh, from there has, we have not provided or provisioned any uh, guidance from the State Department to talk about um, any issues as it relates to uh, domestic politics outside of uh on an annual basis, uh, bureaus within the State Department and through the interagency uh, create materials to how to talk about uh, elections in the democracy context, but not in a, you know, the offering punditry or analysis. Uh, so again, I just want to reiterate that any person serving in any uh, capacity, in an official capacity, whether they are a foreign service officer, a civil service officer, a Schedule C employee, or a Senate confirmed position, um, uh, are well aware of what the, uh, and whether they are ambassadors or not, are well aware of what um, is uh, acceptable to talk about while wearing their official duties uh, when they are representing the department in an official capacity.
Next. Uh, you said you weren't aware of any particular foreign reaction to the debate, but the Polish foreign minister tweeted afterwards, among other things, with like a reference to the Roman Empire, it's important to manage one's ride into the sunset. So do you have any reaction to that? And then I've got a separate question. You should uh, ask the Polish foreign minister. Um, I, I think I've exhaustively spoken to this uh, political issue uh, if, to the extent that I can. I really don't have any other commentary to offer. Okay. Well, I don't think you've spoken exhaustively about riding into the sunset. Th that is true. That is true. Um, uh, I will let you ask your follow-up. Okay, kind of right. same region and uh, tangentially related yeah. to the Lebanon questions. Uh, U.S. bases in Europe were put on heightened alert over the weekend. Um, are there any concerns about U.S. citizens there, or is this limited to military personnel, um, or is there any increased danger? So, so on installations, I will let my um, colleagues at the Department of Defense uh, speak to any posture change um, or any uh, anything as it relates to their facilities. What I can say uh, about uh, our embassies and consulate is that there has been no change in operating status uh, of missions in the region. Uh, we, of course, closely monitor and evaluate threat information and adjust our security and operating uh, postures accordingly. I will also say that um, we have a pretty strong track record of uh, adjusting and, uh, our operating procedures swiftly when needed. Um, so uh, I just don't have any uh, assessment to offer at this time. Uh, our, like I said, our diplomatic facilities continue to be under the same posture that they were. And one more on Europe. Yeah. Do you have any reactions to the first round of French parliamentary elections? And separately, Hungarian Prime Minister Orban said that he is now forming an alliance with right-wing groups in Austria and the Czech Republic, they're calling it the Patriots of Europe, and that it would be the largest right-wing group in European politics. Do you have any comments on that? So on your second question, I don't. And on your uh, first uh, question, I'm just not going to get ahead of the French process. Uh, what I can say is that France is a vital partner. It's our oldest ally with whom we have a uh, long and proud history of democratic values. Uh, we have full confidence that uh, and strength in France's democratic institution and processes. And uh, we intend to continue our close collaboration with the French government across the full spectrum spectrum of foreign policy priorities. Can I just go back to the, the, the embassy question sure. in Europe? You said there's no change in operating status, but is there any change at all? There is not. Security none. status? There is there's none. none. There so, is not. So all embassies are open. There isn't like a heightened security. Well, whether they're open or not, Matt, I'd have to go through a litany of lists. But to, to Nick's question uh, in linking it to the yeah. status and posture. Related to this. Correct. There's, no, not, there, there's there, been there's no, change no change linked to that. Right. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Camilla. Also related, just out of um, interest, with the the reporting is that the U.S. military bases are on heightened alert and a pretty high level of alert. Some reporting saying the highest in ten years. Um, is it is it normal for U.S. military bases to be put on such high alert and there to be no change in in security status for embassies? Is that well? They are uh, you. I think we're, we go down a rabbit hole of whether uh, military installations and diplomatic facilities are necessarily always in the exact same place or not, which isn't uh, always the case. Um, so but just as a precaution. What I, I, just, I just don't want to uh, get into hypotheticals. What I can say is that as it relates to our embassies and consulates, there is no change in operating status uh, of missions that we have in the region. But uh, when it comes to travel advisory warnings, when it comes to the safety and security of our citizens and our diplomats, when it comes to the operating status of our uh, facilities, whether they are embassies or consulates, uh, this is something that we closely monitor and evaluate. And it's something that we monitor and evaluate in real time. Uh, and we have the ability to adjust our security and operating postures accordingly. We have the ability to do that swiftly when necessary. Uh, but I just have no updates for you in any posture change on our end. Okay. And just um, uh, uh, while well, I'm going to defer to other people who might have questions on the Middle East region. Okay. All right. Shannon. You. Thank you. Uh, same topic, really, but the worldwide caution alert that is in place right now, uh, specifically advising uh, the LGBTQI plus community that they could be an increased risk of threat traveling abroad through the month of June. It seems to be more focused on pride celebrations. As we enter July, uh, does the State Department believe that threat has lifted or will begin to lift? I have no, uh, first, let me just say, I have no um, updates on that 
pride, uh, and I'm saying this broadly, sometimes it is observed at different times of the year, uh, depending on what country you are in. I understand that also to be the case sometimes in the uh, various communities within the United States as well. So um, no, I have no, nothing to preview in terms of changing our, our posture there. Uh, Jolie will go. Actually, hold on, before I come to you, Alex has had his hand up. I'll come back to you. Go ahead. Yeah. This one about the President's leadership at the NATO summit next week. Uh, President Zelensky gave an interview to the U.S. Uh, outlet yesterday. He said that the U.S. doesn't see Ukraine in NATO today because he said you know, the U.S. is afraid to, quote-unquote, annoy Putin. I know you guys have been talking about some sort of breach uh, in the up upcoming summit. Why is it not convincing <laughs> enough for the Ukrainians in terms of you know, uh, your intention to see Ukraine in NATO? Well, I, I'm certainly not going to speak for the Ukrainians, but uh, let me just say that uh, we have uh, no problem um, holding Russia to account. Uh, I don't, e don't even want to justify it by saying annoy. Uh, we have no problem holding Russia to account. And over the course of this conflict, since their brutal invasion into Ukraine, we have taken a number of steps from export control sanctions uh, to hold the Russian Federation accountable. Uh, on top of all that, we of course have uh, offered so much support to our Ukrainian partners when it comes to uh, security assistance, economic assistance, humanitarian assistance. And I will also just note for folks, because uh, I, I, I believe um, uh, uh, you all weren't able to uh, attend because it was a president's trip, but just uh, two weeks ago, the president signed a bilateral security agreement with uh, President Zelensky. Um, underlying and uh, reassuring our commitment to the people of Ukraine, because we believe that uh, a commitment such as that one um, is critical to ensuring Ukraine's uh, security democratically, economically, uh, and in a security sense uh, as well. So just to be clear, so U.S. wants to see Ukraine in NATO and is not afraid of annoying Putin? You have that. seen this Secretary of State and this President talk about how we believe that it is important there be a bridge uh, to Ukraine's uh, membership in NATO. Of course, this bilateral security agreement is not uh, a replacement for that, but it is one of the things uh, that we view as a part of that bridge uh, to one day uh, Ukraine being able to join NATO. Look, we have long said that we uh, support and affirm NATO's uh, open door policy. Thank you. I have two more on the South Caucasus. The Secretary spoke about Georgia today, and he said that we have taken some actions clearly to talk about sanctions. Uh, and um, you know, the weeks, uh, actually, a couple of days after the initial sanctions first tranche was announced, the reports that uh, Georgia's security service chief uh, was in the United States. You got, also guys have invited Georgia's foreign minister to Washington next week. Aren't you concerned you are sending out mixed messages? What, what do you mean, Alex? By inviting the officials and then telling us that we're sanctioning the officials, you know, uh, imposing visa restrictions. Well, uh, look, Alex, when it comes to Georgia, and I you know we've spent a lot of time in this briefing room talking about um, some of the legislation that uh, has recently passed, it, it's important that also we continue to engage with appropriate officials when the Georgian government, uh, it is a country we continue to have uh, a range of uh, issues that we want to prioritize in the context of that bilateral relationship with. And while, of course, when it comes, when it has come to this specific legislation, you've heard me and Matt talk about uh, the many issues that we have and how we believe it is counter to Georgia's own um, EU aspirations, It's we still believe it's important to engage and there continue to be other issues that uh, we have no doubt we'll, we'll talk about with them. Thank you. And finally, on Azerbaijan, uh, there have been some high-level engagements with Azerbaijan. The Secretary spoke with Aliyev, and last week, Jim spent his uh, days in Baku. Um, is there a concern that these high-level engagements keep happening uh, without securing the release of political prisoners? Uh, Alex, this is a, a long process, and it requires us to have continued uh, engagement, and it's something that I would expect both uh, the Secretary and Assistant Secretary O'Brien and others to be uh, continue to be focused on. Well, Julia, you've had your hand up. I'll come to you, Michelle, right after. Go ahead, Julia. Um, I wanted to uh, yeah. ask about the uh, reported coup in Bolivia yeah. and the reports today that the former president's accusing um, the president of staging a self 
coup to gain popularity. I was wondering um, what the State Department uh, makes of this allegation and if the posture toward this is changing. So we're continuing to monitor the situation in Bolivia, as I imagine many um, in the international community are. Uh, we understand and have taken note the number of viewpoints that have emerged in recent days, uh, and we welcome independent analysis into the events of June 26th. Uh, what I want to say broadly, though, is that uh, these events in Bolivia make clear that uh, democracy continues to remain fragile in some parts of our hemisphere, and uh, the United States intends to work together in line with the OAS Charter and the Inter-American Democratic Charter to protect the democratic institutions um, of our countries and other countries. Are you concerned that if you know it does turn out to be a self coup that that will create even more instability in the area? You know, we said we'd welcome independent analysis of these events. I will um, let that process play out first before um, offering additional uh, perspective. Gita, go ahead. Thank you. A question on the presidential elections in Iran, mm -hmm. uh, Badan. The government claims that forty percent uh, claims forty percent participation. Um, although uh, the diaspora uh, disputes that figure. I was wondering, now, there are two candidates that are going into the second round. One is uh, the well-known hardline Saeed Jalili, and the other one's been presented as a reformist. I was wondering, what is the State Department's overall assessment of the um, the, the situation and this election. So uh, first, let me just say, you know, we're not in a position to confirm or uh, any turnout number or speculate on uh, what the implications of that might mean uh, for the uh, Iranian regime. Um, our viewpoint is that even the Iranian government's official numbers about turnout are most like most other things as it relates to the Ir Iranian regime are uh, unreliable. Uh, our view is that uh, these elections in Iran are not free and fair and we have no expectation that these elections and whatever the outcome might be will lead to a fundamental change in Iran's direction or lead the Iranian regime to offer uh, more respect for human rights and more dignity for its citizens. Um, so I just don't have any uh, prognosis to offer, Gita. Um, but on, as you probably know, uh, the Islamic Republic was allowed to have polling stations mm -hmm. here on the U.S. soil. Uh, I was wondering... If what is that decision based on, is it a treaty, is it a diplomatic norm to allow another country to open, to have polling stations uh, for their citizens on U.S. soil, especially that Canada did not allow such a thing and the U.S. Is the, was probably the first country to impose major sanctions on Iran and is, has talked about Iran, the Islamic Republic as being as conducting transnational um, suppression against the dissidents. So what is the decision to allow another country, especially in a case like Iran, so, to uh, open to our polling stations? I, I'm happy to uh, check on uh, any technical specifics on how such a process um, is uh, determined. I'll have to get back to you on that. But let me just say that uh, in this context, uh, foreign uh, governments uh, carrying out election-related activities in the U.S., uh, they need to do so in a matter that is consistent with U.S. law and regulation. Um, we respect the rights of Iranian citizens and the diaspora uh, protesting Iran's elections or choosing to participate in Iran's elections. I, and I will also just note that uh, the Iranians have conducted uh, this kind of activity in the United States before, so this is um, nothing new, and as have a number of other governments, uh, especially in the time that I, I have worked here as well. But I'm happy to check about the uh, specific technical process for you. Thank you. Uh, when you said that uh, m most figures released by the Iranian government are unreliable does that go does that um, uh, extend to uranium enrichment centrifuge numbers of centrifuges running oil exports well I mean in the context of, of that question if you uh, specifically well, as it relates to its nuclear uh, activities you, you, that is certainly anything that the Iranian that government? is certainly one of the reasons why we have uh, insisted that the uh, Iranian regime uh, appropriately open its door to the IAEA as persistent fair, fair enough. So, so uh, agreements you would which you, would, so you would say that it extends to that you don't believe them on anything they had 
do not have a track record of credibility when it comes On to anything. The, I think that would be a fair assessment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, can we go back to Israel? Sure. Uh, some German newspapers have said today that Israel's invasion of Lebanon is expected to be imminent or in two weeks. Uh, do you have any signs that uh, support uh, such prediction? So I uh, spoke to this a little bit when answering Matt's question. I, I don't have a prognosis to, to offer. What I can say is that restoring calm on the blue line is a top priority for the United States, and it's uh, something that we think needs to be of the utmost importance to our partners in Israel and uh, for Lebanon as well. Uh, we are concerned by the levels of violence, and we're continuing to work towards a diplomatic solution that would allow Israeli and Lebanese citizens to return home and to live in peace and security. Uh, it's our viewpoint, again, that the ceasefire proposal that President Biden laid out when he gave remarks on it, uh, it, it would accelerate the possibility of progress, and that includes lasting security uh, along Israel's northern border. And are you aware of any U.S. official uh, or officials going to the region this uh, week? To I, I don't have any uh, travel to, to announce. Uh, Jalil. Thank you very much, Vinath. Uh, two on Pakistan, one on Afghanistan. Um, Pakistani parliament, uh, uh, the vice prime minister said that uh, the U.S. Uh, did un unsolicited interference when 368 congressmen favored and seven opposed that the elections were fair. Do you condemn such statement by him? That, are, you, uh, are you talking about the House resolution? Yes, the, the House, House resolution. Was, so, uh, it was a bipartisan, so I hope you can condemn it in a so strong term. So let term. me just say, as, as a standard practice, you know, we're not going to speak to pending uh, congressional legislation. I will also note that um, in the United States of America, in our democratic system, Congress is a separate uh, but co-equal uh, branch of government. L let me just say broadly that when it comes to Pakistan, uh, our most senior officials, whether it be Secretary Blinken, Assistant Secretary Liu, Ambassador Bloom, we have consistently and privately and publicly urged Pakistan to respect uh, the rights of its people in line with its constitution and international commitments. And we urge the government of Pakistan to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms, including the freedom of expression, freedom of association, peaceful assembly, uh, and the freedom of religion as well. Uh, the United Nations uh, Arbitrary Committee for Detention just today uh, said that Imran Khan detention is illegal and fake. And this is one issue that for the last one year has brought, you know. Oh, I'm aware. So, uh, like, uh, so you don't, uh, from here standing, you don't condemn that election frauds and you don't condemn... Uh, Imran Khan detention while the UN is doing it, and your ambassador still has not uh, visited who the congressman. So, like, where where is where is the uh, State Department so standing on so I, many? I will I let the United Nations offer any clarity on the comments that they've provided. Uh, and in the case of uh, Mr. Khan, you've heard us say this before. This is an internal matter um, for Pakistan. I don't have any um, assessment to offer from Just here. Just last one. Uh, Doha's third conference is going, yeah. and again, this issue is... Uh, I raise it a lot because I'm just living right next to it. You know, there's a common saying, you educate a man, you educate a family, you educate a woman, you educate a whole village. Mm -hmm. In my backyard, another terrorists are going to be raised in coming years, right? Because when their moms are not educated, uh, and you guys are still cooperating with the Taliban. Like for me to even ask this so question is of so much risk. Jalil, you what's your understand. question? And I hope. So my question is that I feel so bad that while I'm raising this question is the State Department and putting my life at risk while raising such questions, that why is the U.S. giving any sort of support to the Taliban while the so third year has started and women are without education? So we are not. Um, uh, I'm really not sure what your question was there, but how about this? How about I offer a little bit of an update from uh, the Doha 3 conference? Uh, to take a step back, uh, Special Representative Tom West and Special Envoy Rina Amiri are attending these UN convened meetings uh, in Doha on Afghanistan this week, along with closest allies, uh, 
dozens of countries and international organizations and others are present. Uh, we committed to participating in this after receiving assurances from the UN that the discussion would meaningly address human rights, particularly the plight of women and girls, and importantly that there would be opportunities for engagement in Doha with But Afghan Vidan, the women and education society. is not this uh, typical answer that you're reading to me. I'm personally let, let requesting me just, you that, Vedant, that when women are if, not If you're going to interrupt me, we're going to no, stop no, taking your questions. You. I just want to no, you uh, absolutely are. A little bit I'm that. happy to stop calling on you, Jalil. No, 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 Vedant. We I'm can sorry move if on to other this questions. If you'll let me finish, okay. if you let me finish, and then we've got a couple more hands okay. that I, My I would like to get through. My apologies. So, at a session at the Doha 3 conference on the economy, Special Rep West and Special Envoy Amiri also made clear that the Afghan economy cannot grow while half the population's rights are not respected. It is well known that the Taliban's policies are robbing the Afghan economy of over a billion dollars uh, per year and GDP. You had your band in the back. And then I will I, Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the Taliban, one of the Taliban spokesperson uh, tweeted that it was pledged that restrictions on banking and economic avenues should be lifted, citing um, uh, citing most countries at the conference supporting that, including the U.S. Is that inaccurate? So I, I don't have a specific uh, readout from the the conference at, at the at the moment, Kylie. But what I can say is that uh, Tom made clear that the primary reason private banks um, have reservations about doing more business uh, in Afghanistan is uh, reputational and that it is rooted in the Taliban's atrocious human rights conduct. Uh, we know that the Taliban often uh, complains about sanctions, but given the broad general license issued by the Treasury Department, relief organizations as well as businesses have the leeway uh, they need to support the Afghan people. So no restrictions on the banking and economic avenues that you can uh, that you are aware of at this time. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I'm happy to check with the team and get back to you if we have and a readout. Any update on the Swiss fund that was created more than two years ago? Like how much of that money has actually been put to use in the country? Uh, I don't have a breakdown, but we're happy to check with the team. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. The Islamic resistance front in Iraq announced on Sunday that it will target U.S. interests if a conflict erupts between Israel and Hezbollah. What is your position and your response? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the first part of your question. Who? The Islamic resistance front in Iraq okay. announced on s Sunday that it will target U.S. interests if a conflict Perhaps between Israel and Hezbollah. So first, let me just say, since October 7th, when we look at the whole region, the United States has prioritized de-escalation and ensuring that this conflict uh, doesn't spread. That continues to be the case. Uh, when it comes to Iraq, though, uh, we uh, expect and uh, fully intend to work closely with our partners in Iraq. Um, and this is something that uh, uh, Mr. Sudani and other leaders across the government of Iraq have also made clear that uh, they would intend to hold um, interests or groups that uh, choose to target American interests accountable. And that's something that we'll continue uh, to push for uh, as well. Jackson, go ahead. Thanks, Adan. The Secretary of Brookings said that we should expect an announcement at the NATO summit regarding economic support for Ukraine. What would that look like? Can you specify what he meant? Uh, no, because I'm not going to get ahead of the secretary, and you all should tune in to the NATO summit next week. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, last week, the House Republicans in the Congress, they introduced an amendment to the foreign appropriating bill by um, which says that if it's passed, that it would designate Iraqi Supreme Judicial Council and its president as an Iranian-controlled asset. I understand that you are not commenting on the pending bill, but my question is on the reactions from Iraq, foreign minister and also the acting parliament speaker, the, the president of Iraq, they reacted to this amendment and they said that, which the acting parliament said that if this passed, it will be a dangerous turning point in Baghdad and Washington relations. What's your comment to this? Reactions. So let me just uh, again reiterate what you said. I'm not going to comment on uh, pending uh, legislation with Congress. Uh, what I can say, though, is that that is um, not the kind of uh, relationship we believe that we have with the uh, government of Iraq. Uh, and over the course of our relationship, we, there are a number of areas in which we have worked uh, closely with them, especially in the uh, security and counterterrorism space, as well as um, energy and energy infrastructure. And we'll continue to work 
work with them and deepen our cooperation on those areas. And what's, your, what, what's the U.S. administration position on Iraq's Sperm Digital Council and also its president? Do you think that it's an independent body or it's uh, an Iranian-controlled asset? Uh, I'm happy to check back with the team for you. I don't have anything specific on that. Go ahead. And then we have got a couple more that we're going to wrap. Just talk about the resolution passed uh, in the House regarding Pakistan. Uh -huh. But please correct me if I'm wrong. State Department also raised same questions regarding the credibility of Pakistani elections held in Feb this year and uh, asking for the investigation of reports on massive rigging in those elections. You still asking those questions from the Pakistani government? Uh, this is something that we have continued to raise uh, with our uh, partners in Pakistan. Yes, that continues to be uh, an area of focus of ours. So the Department of Homeland Security has identified over 400 immigrants from Central Asia and other regions as subjects of concern due to their entry into the U.S. through an ISIS link human smuggling network. What measures are being taken to mitigate this threat and ensure national security? So we're aware of this report, and this is something that my colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security can speak to in more detail. Uh, let me just say, though, that we work uh, uh, very closely with international counterparts, including our partners in uh, Central Asia, on issues like counterterrorism partnerships, exchange information on uh, potential threats, and uh, as well as improving screening capabilities. But would you say I'll something about the, uh, to that more. Uh, so would you say something about the uh, multiple bombings uh, in Nigeria, like more than 50 people dead, more than 100 are injured? So we condemn this horrific attack that took place in Borno on June 29th. These attacks show a disregard of human life and a reminder of the ongoing threat posed by terrorism in the region. We offer our condolences to the families of those killed and wish a full recovery to those who were uh, injured. Goyal, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, good question. <clears throat> this debate has been going on in India and also in the U.S. and even during Modi second term, Modi two, and now it continues Modi three. As far as U.S.-India relations are concerned, because of uh, some countries uh, don't have a good relation with the uh, U.S. because they support terrorism and all those things like Iran and uh, North Korea and among others. And but India or Modi is uh, friends with them or they deal with them because of uh, the national needs of India, uh, including with the Iran and also mm -hmm. with the Soviet Union, with Mr. Putin, with the Russia. So how are you going to deal with India-U.S. relations in this midst of because there are sanctions uh, against those countries, but uh, India or Modi is saying that we have a national need and we have to deal with them in our own. But as far as U.S. relations are concerned, we are with the U.S. and we will be with the U.S. because largest democracy on the globe and the oldest democracy on the globe, and now we celebrate, of course, the 4th of July. So where do we stand? So uh, let me just say you, this is something you have this should be not new to you, Goyal, that uh, India is a country in which we are uh, deepening our uh, relations with in a number of key spaces, cause especially as it relates to uh, deepening our economic ties, deepening our security cooperation. Uh, the president had the opportunity to briefly see Prime Minister Modi, Modi on the margins of the G7 a couple of weeks ago. Um, so this is an area we will continue to um, uh, cultivate this relationship. You are no stranger to the fact that we hosted India for a um, state visit uh, last summer, and I imagine there will be a number of uh, additional areas where we continue to uh, deepen cooperation. National Security Advisor Sullivan just had a visit to uh, Delhi a number of weeks ago as well. And second, sir, thank you. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has been trying even uh, during his uh, second term that uh, India wants a good relation with Pakistan, neighboring, neighboring country, because if we have good neighbors and we process prospects and all that India and Modi said that uh, now time have come for Pakistan to develop for needs of their people national needs not just for military and not uh, uh, corruptions and all that what I'm asking you now because uh, still now Mr. Uh, Sharif or Jah Sharif have been trying to say that we not want to have good relation with India but India is saying as in the last five years that terrorism and talks cannot go together Pakistan have to condemn terrorism fully against India is still going on. So where do we stand as for a triangle U.S.-India, U.S.-Pakistan and India-U.S. relations? Well, we would hope that any country on the face of the planet condemns terrorism anywhere, but uh, ultimately this is a uh, between uh, India and Pakistan. Uh, broadly, of course, we uh, welcome um, any countries uh, uh, 
making more positive relations with their neighbors. But as it relates to this specifically, I just uh, don't have anything to offer. Thank Go you. Ahead. The pink. Many uh, women journalists in Israel who were reporting this weekend on the protest of ultra-Orthodox Jews against the Supreme Court's order to enlist them for military service have complained publicly about insults and uh, violence from these protesters who call them uh, whores among, among any, uh, more insults. Um, what is your reaction to these insults, to this violence? towards uh, women journalists. So first, let me just say um, any kind of violence or insult to journalists who um, are just doing their job in this instance, uh, covering uh, some protests um, is is um, fully unacceptable. Um, time and time again, you've heard us say that we believe uh, it's important and imperative for journalists uh, to be able to do their job, especially in this region uh, of the world. Uh, but beyond that, I don't have, as it relates to the uh, protests itself, I don't have anything. Um, that is a, it's an internal matter um, for the government of Israel, but uh, unequivocally, uh, journalists need to be able to do their jobs and uh, insults, name calling, and any kind of uh, uh, violence is unacceptable. Um, all right, thanks everybody. Thank you.